All right, three, two, one, and it, it just turned six o'clock for me, so this is as good of a time as ever to start. And before I begin, I should tell you guys that I actually do have some companion slides to this, although most of this is kind of going to be off of the cuff. And if you go to, I think it's tinyurl.com forward slash freaknik2013, you can see the slides. I like to use the slides just as a supplement to what I am saying, though, and ho hopefully I will be able to convey all the importance of what, what's going on and such. So let's see, there's a, little, a few of you there. So this could be a very close and intimate talk. I like that. And I also, I want to thank Freaknik organizers, especially Ben, especially Will Pig and Dagmar for setting this up on kind of short notice. I got this, I had some personal things going on, so I'm not able to actually be there physically, but I'm very happy I'm able to be here virtually because I, there's, there's, Freaknik, I've actually been going to Freaknik, it's year 17 now, I think. I've been every year since year five. And every year it's been fantastic. And I think the Nashville community, or I guess the Murfreesboro community, is really, really quite worth it. And you guys have something special there that I haven't found anywhere else. So um, let's start off, give a round of applause to Freaknik and for like Will Pig and Not Larry and everything. Because they do a ton of work to get this together. All right, so let me just start out. Uh, this will kind of show the direction of the narrative that I want to construct here. Uh, first, has everyone here, when I say the word NIM, do you know what I mean? And the word I mean NYM. Anyone? It is short for, you might say, pseudonym, or short for anonym, or basically we're getting and trying to construct the notion of what identity is, and specifically what online identity is, and how the two kind of interplay together. So here's the something else I will quote to you, and let's see how many people can recognize it. Quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble. Unquote. Anybody know where that comes from? Okay, where? All right, good, good, good. It, it was, okay. And where does the, okay, second question here, where does the First Amendment come from? Uh, oh, this is good. You guys are smart. Okay, I love it when people are smart in the audience. And next question. So, so Magna Carta aside, where did the Constitution come from? And this is where we get to the meat of it. I, I would say technically. So normally I go with the whole, have you guys heard of the Federalist Papers, for example? All right. So the Fe and the Federalist Papers are often an example that we use to promote the notion of pseudonyms and why pseudonymity is important. Federalist Papers, it was Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison were kind of constructing this notion to put together the idea of what the Constitution should be. Because before we had the Constitution, we had this construct called the, the Articles of Confederation. This is the stuff you should have been learning in school if you weren't sleeping through it. And the Articles of Confederation basically established a government that had a very... The states had a whole lot of power, and the federal government was kind of this weak thing, kind of slung together. And there were a lot of problems they had with it. So, for example, they couldn't enforce the monetary policies. So, in, in general, all these states had their own financial policies, and it, later on we see things like the Federal Reserve. But they turned out that they decided the Articles of Confederation and that weak central government they had didn't really hold everything together. So the Federalists came along and wrote articles to you know, various newspapers and such saying, we should have a stronger federal government. We need to rewrite everything from the ground up. We need to basically reboot the government. So the Federalists are on one side. They're saying, oh, we should have a strong federal government. And on the flip side, you have the Anti-Federalists who are saying, well, hold on. We have these other things to consider. What about, what about the rights of the individual against the institution? Things like that. And it's worth noting the anti-federalists were also writing with pseudonyms. Include, I think Brutus is one of them. They had a couple different pseudonyms that they were using. And the next word I think is here is really important. The anti-federalists and the federalists had a discussion and they came to a compromise. And that compromise is what is known as the Bill of Rights. So in fact, we have the Constitution, which grants a lot of authority to a centralized government and creates like the, the, the federal branch of the legislative, the judicial, and the executive, the presidency, and so on. And then you have the Bill of Rights, which exists simply to placate and to give back power to the people, which is why I have things like the First Amendment. And I believe that the reason that it is the First Amendment and, you know, not the Fifth or Sixth is because without that First Amendment and without the ability to free speech 
and a freedom of association and freedom of the press and things like that, you wouldn't have the kind of constructive debate which ultimately, I believe, led to the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So when you begin to think about it, when you begin to think about things like what kind of names and ultimately what we'll get to is attribution, what kind of names you're able to share as, as Moot from 4chan puts it, that's what the country was founded on. And we're in a point right now where a lot of these things and a lot of these principles are beginning to slip away. And there's any number of reasons why I think that's happening. So let me go to the next slide if anybody is watching at slide five. And the title of the slide is Attribution, and I have two pictures on it. On the left side, I have a painting in a museum, and I think it's a Bruegel, actually. And on the, there's a little placard on the painting, which is the attribution of the painting. It's, it's, I think it's the, the, the painter of the painting and various things about the painting and such, right? How many of you have been to a museum and have you seen this? This is the date, this is the time, it gives you the context and the, uh, the, the painter, the, 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 the artist that created that work. And on the right side, I have a picture of a printing press. So here's another interesting question. How many of you can tell me what was the first really important book printed on the printing press? Right, right, right. And Right, right, right. So the first really important thing on the printing press was the Bible. Do you guys know what the second I would consider most important thing on the printing press was? I'll give you a hint. 1517 is the date. And this is really where it gets fascinated. The 95 Theses by Martin Luther. And there's actually, if you think about it, a lot of discussion about this notion of attribution and the fact that before we had the printing press, People were able to just pass out pieces of paper and such, but it wasn't easy to mass produce this stuff. And the printing press gave us the solution to distribution issues. And there's a lot of people who credit the 95 Theses and Martin Luther, which with uh, the impetus for the Catholic Reformation and or the Protestant Reformation, which effectively began the slow slipping slide of the Catholic Church. What's that? Oh, yeah, yes. So salute Johannes Gutenberg, yes. And this gets into the idea of attribution, and there's a fundamental question here, which is, what would happen if the printing press, or Publius, for example, who was writing the, the, the Federalist Papers, what would happen if a judge had gone, or, or there had been a lawsuit about Publius, and a judge had gone and given an order to the newspapers that were publishing these things, that they must reveal what their legal names were? That may have changed the course of the Constitution, and the printing press, if it was halted, like the Catholic Church wanted it to be, and later on we get these issues of piracy, right? These are really fundamental questions to who we are and how we're able to express our identities and that question of who one can share as. You have this question of, am I going to say the same things if my legal name is on it versus a name that I have created is on it? So this leads into another really interesting question, which is, does free speech, which we opened up with, does free speech necessitate anonymous speech? And this is a really interesting question as we're getting the internet and a peer-to-peer -peer connectivity and things like anonymous coming out. This has been coming up a lot. And there's one Supreme Court decision, one Supreme Court case, this all kind of boils back to, and every single legal decision that's coming out about anonymous is referring to it. It's a case from 1995 called McIntyre versus Ohio Elections Commission. And the, the gist of the case is that there was this woman, uh, Miss McIntyre, and she was in Ohio passing out leaflets basically with a political statement on them. And I think it was against the commission or something like that. And she was arrested because the pamphlets that she was passing out did not have her name or an affiliation on them. They were is as close to what they could say before we had the Internet as widespread as it is anonymous because there was no name attributed to it and that decision came in 1995 and the decision was in favor of McIntyre and the majority decision was uh, made by Justice John Paul Stevens and there's a quote that I really love from it which is anonymity is a shield from the tyranny of the majority and when you think about what that means and the social implications of it and the fact that every amazing idea every invention we have had whether it's Galileo Pernicus and everything else started out as a minority decision that they had. That these people had to work against the pull of the establishment in order to craft their idea out and get positive discussion going on. This is something that I think is fundamental to 
democracy in general, and in particular to the United States. So there's two elements to attribution that I want to cover. First is reputation. That is, how do I know that this information that I'm seeing is noteworthy? How do I know I should give it any credence whatsoever? And that notion of credibility comes into play. How do I know that when I'm seeing this thing on Twitter, for example, that I should pay any attention whatsoever to it? And the second is accountability. Accountability meaning if somebody commits a crime on the internet or anywhere else, I need to know how I can bring that person to justice. We have a series of laws, we have a system of laws in the United States and many other countries. Well, how do we bring people to accountability? How do we uphold that sense of justice and that system of laws that we have? And ultimately it boils down to how do we retain the social contract? So. This gets into kind of the foundation of what's going on. You, you can kind of see how this pieces together and permeates through non-technical existence. How do you know that somebody is reliable, right? And this gets also into the notion of trust. How do I know that somebody is trustworthy? And then you have to think, well, what does trust actually mean? Is it, I trust, are, are there different types of trust? So like within the PGP key systems, for example, I can sign somebody's key and that says that I trust them and there's these different trust levels, zero, one, two, and three. But what does that really mean? And what if I trust somebody with money, but I don't trust them to be at work on time? Or if I trust somebody to be at work on time, but I don't trust them to babysit my kids? And these are all questions that are very fundamental, and they define the nature of human communication and human interaction in general. So then when we turn to this notion, I have the next slide up here, called what I call Google's method. It creates this very hierarchical structure, where at the very top, you have what they call a real name, which is usually a driver's license. It's usually something that's issued by a governmental authority or let, let, let's say the physical manifestation of what we would call a central authority. So in the same way that if I want to get an SSL certificate for my website, I go to VeriSign or something like that. And as a CA, they grant me this authority that I can then use and the chain of trust is therefore derived. And the same token, the government gives me something that I can then present if I go into a bar, right? Of course, then the question you have to ask is why is it the bartender or the bouncer at the bar accepts that document, that physical token that says, yes, I'm you know, of the legal age, as opposed to recognizing me, or if I tell them, why do they not trust what I say and they trust that document instead? And there are good reasons for many of that. I'm just asking people to think about that for a moment. So within this hierarchical structure where we have the government-issued ID at the very top, then in kind of the middle ground, in this, what I'm calling Google's method, you have the pseudonyms, right? Because pseudonym literally means it comes from the Greek pseudo or fake. So when you have the real name and fake name dynamic, and you can already see where if fake is or the inverse of real, and then you have this binary notion of true and false, trustworthy and untrustworthy, and in and out and so on. It's captioned with this notion that I have on the diagram, which is that labels give someone else power over you, and in this case it would be the central government, right? So back when we were talking about Publius and the Federalist Papers and then the Bill of Rights, which comes to mitigate that power, well, who is it that has this power and how do we grant it and where does the consent come into play? And the last thing I have in this diagram is that the real name, the things at the top of this hierarchy are more legitimate and then the pseudonyms or the, the nicknames as one might call them, although the nickname is a bit different, is less legitimate. And what does legitimate mean? Does it mean something that we want to allow within our system or something which is less legitimate should be less close to the core? Should that be excluded? And these are all things that I think we need to think about. So then the next slide I have here, the caption on it is, what are the challenges with a real name? And quick question, what do people here think when I say real, when I say a real name? Ones you're born with? Okay, anything else? Ah, okay. Let's attest your current identity. I like that one a lot because there's what's called the identity community, essentially, and nobody can actually agree on what the word identity means. And I think that's kind of funny. Like, people who are, like, really high up in places like uh, PayPal and other places, I'm not going to name names, but it's been kind of colorful watching this discussion going on and nobody can agree on the terms. But when I think of the phrase real, there's two things that I think of, and one of them is this conflation of a real name with legal name, legal name being the name on a legal document, like a driver's license or a name granted you by government in some other form, right? And then there's the alternative version of real, which is a little bit more nuanced, and that is 
the name that I know you by in real life. Because you have the IRL symbol that we all often use in IRC, you know, IRC versus IRL. And thinking about these two notions of real, real existence and, and so on, are important as we tackle the next few things. And a couple of points that I have about why I have a problem with real name and the term in the context of a legal identity is there are negative implications for it. So, for example, what's the opposite of real? I mean, I just answered this earlier, but anyone? Fake. Opposite of real is fake. It's untrustworthy. It's evil. It's something which is outside of the system, right? And that's, that's really negative. You want people to work into together. You don't want to... You, collaboration, not like people coming and trying to disrupt things, right? And then on top of that, as somebody mentioned before, the name you're born with, and perhaps there is a lack of agency involved in that, a lack of ability to decide for yourself what you want to say and how you want to say it, because I think many of you will agree that the name that it's attached to whatever you say often influences what you say and who, to whom you say it. And besides that, we shouldn't be stuck with something like a real name because it's easily substituted with better alternatives, like given name, like a birth name, like a legal name, and all these different ways. But the thing is, once we use these names and these words and these labels, it creates a filter by which we understand and interact with how these names are cast. So if I introduce by one name versus another, it's going to color, in a social sense, the relationship that I have with the person or the entity with whom I've introduced myself. And there's a big, long discussion about where this concept comes from. The earliest I have personally been able to find was Henry II, as he was creating in, I think, the 1200s, the notion of English common law, where, it, it, and this is a derivative of 1066 and William the Conqueror coming in, because American law is also derived from English common law. In fact, when we came and created the Constitution, we actually borrowed English common law. We, we left behind a number of other things, like the monarchy, but, um, it, and it's questionable whether we have ourselves recreated this monarchy in the form of the presidency and of the executive branch. But... Going back to Henry II and what was going on there, that they had all these little cases and all these little basically hobbit shires in England that were cast around all over the place. And they needed to come up with some way to keep a centralized track of everything. And, and that's the point at which they began to sort of formalize what names were and how the government, in this case the, the monarch of Henry II, was able to recognize them. And there are other... There are other elements to this. So, for example, there's a fantastic talk from 28C3, the German conference, by, um, I can't, I've spaced the guy's name, but the talk is called What is in a Name, where he goes into the notion of the Catholic Reformation, as we mentioned before, during which the Catholic Church actually been writing down the names of all the babies who had been baptized so they could have a definitive record of who was a Catholic and who was a heretic. And... On the flip side, you have the discovery of the New World, where because the kings of, say, I think it was Philip of Spain, were unable to go back and forth across the Atlantic over and over again, they had to have some kind of a way to maintain their authority and their rule. So they began keeping track of, who is it that is in this kingdom that I am in charge of? So these are some things that I just want people to consider as we go into that. So the next slide that I have here, it's called My Own Method and kind of a response to Google's method. And the caption here is that labels help define relationships. And there's a lot that I can get into. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time for it. But before I delve into this, how many people here are familiar with uh, Carl Jung and like the conscious and the unconscious? Okay. So to put it uh, succinctly, the conscious or the rational are words, symbols, things like that, something that I can attach to and I can see mathematics, for example. And then you have the unconscious or the irrational, as Jung calls it, and that's more your emotions and mood and instinct and things that can't quite easily be defined. And in fact, one of the things I like to say is because if you say a word or a symbol, we all have our own different interaction with what those words and symbols are. But that symbol stays constant. That symbol is objective in a sense. I can draw a letter. I can draw, like, I, I'm drawing the number one right now, metaphorically speaking, I suppose. And everyone understands what that means, right? Everyone can see that. You can use your senses to interpret that, but it's understanding the meaning that is a very subjective thing. So you have this dynamic of subjective and objective, right? And then when you translate this, and I, I've pictured this in the form of a yin-yang single symbol, because the, you have the black and the white of the yin-yang, and you can spin the yin-yang around, and it turns kind of a grayish, the uncertainty of the yin-yang, at least. And then when you look at that yin-yang as a symbol of a social system, that being yourself, yourself represented in all your emotions and all the, th the interactions that you have with yourself as a system, 
Well, then you look at any other system, and I define Twitter, I define Facebook, and even your driver's license. Each of those are their own three different so social systems right there. A system being a way that you can interact with it, right? So when you have yourself as a system and then, say, a social network or an online social network like Facebook or Twitter or something else, it's a relationship that you have between them which constitutes what I would call... How to put it? So, so you have that relationship between them, and then it's that label that you affix to describe that relationship, which I say is your name. And the beautiful thing about that is when you define it as a relationship rather than just a label that's slapped onto something that is foreign to you, is that you are able to have within a relationship all the properties of a relationship that it offers. So things like consent, things like trust, things like chronology, and things like establishing reputation, all these different th things. And it's all consensual and it's all mutual. It's a very two-way thing. As opposed to something being granted by an authoritative figure, you have a relationship which is by definition two ways. And there, there's all kinds of stuff. If you want to look at the slides, they're up online on tinyurl.com forward slash freaknik2013. But this is something that I think is kind of pivotal, pivotal to the crutch of what I am doing. And the phrase that I have to describe this for is the last one was that labels help somebody else maintain power over you. In this case, it is that labels help define a relationship. So I can delve quickly into the notion of what different types of names are because NIM, as I said before, it's kind of short for pseudonym and a pseudonym being a name that is used to hide a base name, which by definition means that you have two names, right? You have the pseudonym and then you have the base name. So it could be your legal name or your base name is John, but everyone calls you Jack. Now, you might not think of that as a pseudonym, but it can be in some cases. They could also be considered a nickname. In fact, if you have a nickname and a pseudonym, it could be one and the same. And it's interesting how we take these labels and we use the labels to differentiate the, the, the ways in which we describe relationships. So past that, you have things like a polynym and a mononym. A polynym is simply multiple names, so John Smith. And then a mononym is simply one name, or one word or symbol, I should say. So an example of a mononym here is Prince. And I guess the name he had before then was the artist formerly known as Prince. And then he shrank it down to that funny little zigzag looking thing, right? And then one of my favorites is that you have the autonym, which is a name that is bestowed upon oneself. Different from a pseudonym, because an autonym is in itself a base name. So, let's see, I'm slowly running out of time. I don't know how the hell it is that I ramble so long about these things. But I've still got you guys, so I haven't bored you all to death yet. So... There's a couple of things. How many of you have seen the website nimrights.org? If you nymrights.org, and basically the idea. Did you guys see the Nim Wars at all? Nim Wars was when Google Plus came through and they were suspending everybody for using a name that they thought did not look real. In fact, Google actually began to coin this term. They said name shaped names. So, in response to that, we have created this organization. By we, I mean. Some friends of mine, including Kalia, who is Identity Woman on Twitter, and a few others, we've created this thing called NIM Rights. And the purpose of NIM Rights is to establish individual agency and to give people a channel by which they can advocate for something that they believe in. In this case, it is going to be, in my opinion, free speech and the notion of attribution. And there's a couple of projects that we're working on right now. If you go to nimrights.org, there's kind of a, a WordPress blog that we have set up where we're keeping track of events like this that we're speaking at. We also have stickers and we also have an info card because it turns out that, well, everyone in this room, I'm pretty sure, is at least somewhat sympathetic to the, the mo morals and the mission that we're striving towards. Not everyone is, and it's not because they're against it, it's because they don't understand it. So by taking this NIM rights as a way to enable people, but also as a way to educate, we can spread the light. We can basically, Lucifer, the bringer of light, we can literally bring the light to people and say, this is our viewpoint, and we want you to understand it so that we can have a positive discussion about it. So there's a couple of projects that we're working on within NIM rights right now. And one of them is what I call the NIM rights suspended project. And it's similar in a sense to Wendy Seltzer's chilling effects where she's been documenting all the cease and desist orders and takedown notices that people are getting. In this case, I have a little form set up. So if somebody has been suspended by, say, a social network site or really anything else, but they can submit their details and we're trying to create an online documentative history of what's going on. So I'm looking at it right now, and if you go to nimrights.org, there's this link at the top that says Ben Suspended, and you can fill out a form and get yourself added. And most of them are from Google+, Plus because Google has actually still continued to do these suspensions. It's just not as highly publicized anymore. 
uh, and uh, people who are getting hit by are like sex workers and, and things like that and, and people who are sex bloggers and people who are dealing with topics that I believe really should be discussed but they cannot in many cases fight them for their self fight for themselves often either because they don't have enough time or because they have a danger of having multiple names or identities or contexts linked together. So I'm trying to keep track of names and descriptions and things like that on, on this Nimrai suspended project. And we can begin to construct the narrative of what it is, who it is that these people are. It's not just a bunch of ki script kitties and things like that. It's real people with real concerns and real issues. Perhaps it's the, 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 the person who is into something controversial and she doesn't want to get excluded from her Baptist church, right? And she should be, in my opinion, allowed to participate in both the Baptist church and whatever that taboo area is. And this is the kind of tool that we can give to those people so that they can have the power to at least continue and have people fight on their behalf. So the next project that we're working on, we haven't launched a website for this yet, but if people in the audience are interested, please approach me. So... All of the Nimrods and the suspended things that happened were because of what was called the real names policy, the Google thing, the Google real names policy. And it turns out that everyone who I know of who has been suspended from Google Plus at the moment has all been using the free Google account. So it turns out that if you have a Google Apps account, and many of you probably use the Google Apps account for work and other things, it's a bit different because as a company, you can set your own policies. So we've actually gone and created our own NIMS policy that we put in a GitHub and among other places. And we're creating a Google Apps account that we want to give to people who we believe should be able to express themselves in any way that they choose. On Google Plus, without the caveats that come with, I think, are unfair from Google. And it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. And we're trying to construct a two-month uh, two study. We're trying to get, I think, up to 20 people involved in this, where people just come on to Google Plus and begin interacting with it as regular people, except that they're using a name that seems maybe Google won't like it. And we want to use this to demonstrate first that people can enjoy and experience and have a relationship with Google in a way that, that there's nothing problematic that's going to come from it. And if something does pr come from it problematically, that we have the tools and resources within our community to deal with that. And it's going to be really interesting to see because I don't believe that Google has actually ever actually challenged anybody who was using a paid account. And once you introduce money into the equation, because at the moment, if you're just using a typical Google account, it's a free service and you are basically fodder. You are basically giving them data and you are their product. You are, you are their algorithm they're using to sell data to marketers. You're not their customer. But in this case, you would be their customer because it's like five bucks a month for account or something like that. And I think that that changes the dynamic and it cr creates a different kind of contract. And when you have these two different policies interacting with each other, I will be very interested to see what happens. So one of the discussions we've had with an IDESG, the Identity Ecosystem Steering Group, the government thing I've been working on, is what is an identity provider? Is it Google or Facebook from whom you get something, you, you, you get this token, maybe it's an open ID type thing? And if that's what it is, then could the service that we're creating also be a NIM-friendly identity provider? And last thing I want to say here, because I'm, I can't believe I rambled on that long, but you can join the IDESG, this government thing I'm working on. You can email me or Twitter me at aesthetics at A-E-S-T-E-T-I-X on Twitter. And please join this government -y stuff, because the, the NSTIC, NISTIC or NSTIC as they call it, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, because if we can get people involved, and you don't have to do much, if you just want to sit there and vote against things that you don't think are okay, that's okay too. You don't, you don't have to do anything except come in, you know, 10 minutes every year and vote on bad policies to, to, to work as a democracy to help to make sure that things don't happen. There's no charge. And I have joined NSTIC as Aesthetics, and anybody can join you. Don't even have to be a U.S. citizen. So I think with that, I'm going to kind of settle back and see if anybody has any questions, because I feel like I've covered a lot, and I want to see what people think. And I have about 15 minutes left before I have to take off. So um, any questions so far? Take the mic if you have a question. Anybody have a question?
wondering about the uh, policies that you set up on Google and what exactly you're uh, sort of specifically def ready to defend against or deflecting. Right. Right. So the policy is that there, there's a couple of elements to it. And one of it is just to create something, period, with regards to policy. So th there's two real reasons that we're doing it. One of them is to create this kind of a chicken fight between Google's real names policies and our own. Um, I, will, I will Twitter a link to the, the policy that we're putting together. But it's basically, what is the balance that we can have of the technical failures that every, social, every um, digital system has right now? Because there's certain things like SQL injection type stuff that we're just going to run into problems with. And at the same time, how do we mitigate those while at the same time respecting people's abilities to express themselves? And then there's the accountab accountability issue on top of that. So the real thing that I'm interested in doing with this identity policy that we're crafting, or this names policy, I should say, is I have no hope at all of getting Google to like swap out their policy with our policy. I, I don't think that's even worth uh, addressing at all. Because Google is this huge monolithic entity, and we're just a couple of radical advocates that are trying to do something we think is positive. However, there are a lot of companies right now that are coming onto the internet and they're setting up services and they're trying to figure out, well, what do we do about names and how do we handle that right now? And maybe there's a service where you have to sign up with the name. And I think the advantage there will be reaching out to those people and getting them to set up little policies and allowing the services to grow over time. I think that's where the real meat of it is. And I'm also reaching out to non-technical places. I've been reaching out to law enforcement, for example, because this gets back into the accountability issue, is a lot of people are thinking, did somebody say something? No. Uh, okay. So you had the accountability issue, and that ha if somebody commits a crime, well, how do you bring them to justice? And I think that's a very valuable question, and I think that working with law enforcement and with people who are dealing with things like, think PayPal, for example, how much of PayPal's transactions are fraud. Now, of course, PayPal is a bit different because I, I, I should differentiate something here. You have the difference between financial and expression. So with PayPal, for example, they have different types of policies, but a lot of those are in place by law. So if I'm dealing with like, money issues, so Western Union and PayPal, as they bring those financially on, in many cases there are laws requiring people to use their legal name, but there are also laws protecting them. Another example is HIPAA, like the health care uh, for doctors and hospitals that are moving to medical information and such. Yes, there is a legal requirement for people to have their legal names on there, but there are also legal protections so that their identities don't get compromised. So in the United States, I believe that's only legal and medical. In Europe, they have a group called NSA, and they have another one called ECHR, um, what is it, European Court of Human Rights, where not only do they have a court which is established with a, a system of, um, of, of policies and laws which addresses all data, like specifically all data. If there's, some, if, if there's a website that is on a European server and a European service that is online, they are required by law to, if they get any kind of intrusion or any kind of security compromise, to report that. Basically, think of HIPAA, and imagine HIPAA was applied to every, every internet service, including Reddit. So on top of that, ECHR also cons construes a place that you can go to report infractions. So for example, if I'm using Google and Google asks me for my government-issued ID, I could actually then go to this court and report Google for violating that policy. Get into that point is kind of a pipe dream, and I think that these policies that we're trying to instantiate are kind of a, a stepping stone in the right direction. So if you think about that, one of the it's basically like a first draft of, doc, of a document. We put out what we think is really useful. We'll send it out to different places and get them to respond, we can't do this because, and that creates an exception that we can add into the policy and that makes it more robust over time. That was a little long-winded. Does that answer the policy question, though? Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions, or could I pick a random topic to ramble about? Or oh, What's a good resource for, because um, I know there's, the, there's one that protects, that's a bunch of lawyers that protect people in, in privacy that's, I want to say it has an F in it, but is there a good website that has that type of, um, the FF, um, can't remember the name of it, but that, there's a good resource for that type of news, because um, I didn't even know about the Google names thing, and my actual last name oh, okay. is Google spelled backwards, so 
I wasn't included in that uh, cancellation. Okay. So are you looking for a resource that's keeping track of things like that, or are you looking for a resource uh, that will empower you more? Yes. Okay. A, a, a site for news or for updates on this topic. So that's kind of tricky right now because there's a whole lot of gray area around this. I would, I mean, follow me on Twitter. I usually ramble about this a lot. We're trying to post things. We have a Nimrites mailing list that you can subscribe to. If you go to the IDESG, um, it's ID, like letters ID ecosystem.org, and there's a lot of discussions going on in there. It's, it's a really, really large ecosystem, and in, in fact, some of the surveillance stuff that is going on right now actually fits into this. Uh, I think Snowden has actually addressed this stuff a little bit. In terms of ways that you can become more empowered on your own, um, she's going to love me for saying this, but my friend Sarah Downey, who actually gave a talk at DragonCon with about this stuff, she works at a company called Abine, that's A-B-I-N-E dot com, and they specialize in basically... They specialize, it, there's two things that I know that they really do well. One of them is they have this service called Do Not Track, where it will actually cleanse your, um, your information from all these different websites. And you can actually pay them a, a monthly fee, I think, and they will keep taking it down so that you have this almost a persistent identity takedown going on. And they also have a service called Mask Me, which it's sort of, do you guys know the concept of a remailer? A remailer is like, I have a server that I send an email to and that server strips all the identifying information and sends it on to the, the, the target I wanted to go to. And that's a way that you can send an email without having to be traced back to you. And yes, there is a burden of trust in the remailer itself, but that, that's, for another, that's for another talk. So Mask Me is something that works like a remailer except for credit card information, which I find very interesting. So those are two resources and past that, um, I, I would say follow me on Twitter, follow Identity Woman on Twitter. She tends to talk about this stuff a lot. There's not really any kind of a central forum that I know of. If you're interested in government -y stuff, there's the IDEcosystem.org. If you're interested in European stuff, like non-American, there's ENISA, the NSA organization. But still, this is a very new field, and I don't know of many people who have put a whole lot of thought into it yet. So is that useful to you? I can expand on different parts if you want. That's good. Thanks. And I have, I'm, I'm waiting. Yeah, is somebody else going to ask a question? Okay. I was waiting for the pedophile question. It never came up, though. I have this. What's that? Oh, there you are. A fortuitous. I just happened to think of the question, and, and Not Larry happens to come at the same time. Hi, Not Larry, how's it going? <laughs> so I can go into some details on some of the interesting cases that I've been uh, discussing with people, if you're interested. Okay, so, so I'm going to limit to three, because I actually have to go in about five minutes. But... Um, one that I think is really fascinating, and this came up when I was at this IDESG plenary uh, a few months back. So a lot of discussion right now about who can use NIMS online. You think about script kitties, and you think of somebody using your, their World of Warcraft account and things like that. I got an email from somebody who, um, what is it? His wife is an Iranian national, and she lives in the United States. And I'm trying to think of how to word this. What? Okay. His wife is an Iranian national, and she lives in the United States, and she can't use her legal name on Google+, Plus because if she does, and she says something that the Iranian government doesn't like, because of the Green Revolution that happened a few years ago in Iran, well, Iran is an Islamic country, and they're very much a regime, and they're authoritarian. Her wife's family could be taken away for it. They could be tortured for it, and things like that. So... These are the kinds of things that often come up. One of the actual one of the one of the impetuses for crafting the, the, the omnividual.com project and these policies that we're trying to do, it's not just so that I can you know, say whatever I want. It's so that people like her are able to express themselves online without fear of harm coming to themselves or their families. So, like the pedophile question that comes up a lot, 
well, and I've actually had this asked to me directly during some of these conferences that I've been to with the government. I've had government people directly ask me, don't, don't pseudonyms help empower pedophiles? And my response is, well, yes, but there's a lot of other stuff that empowers pedophiles too, like, you know, driving around in vans and Tootsie Rolls. And on the flip side, yeah, you know, they, they, they drive in vans, so we have to ban vans. They, they use Tootsie Rolls to lure little kids, so we have to ban Tootsie Rolls. And they, they dress up as clowns, so we have to ban clowns. I'm okay with that one, but things like that. And on the flip side, though, if your child is being stalked by an online predator, your child can use a pseudonym to protect themselves. And when people hear that, they tend to come around pretty quickly. And it's just something interesting to think about. And the last example I'm going to cover, because I'm actually running out of time here, is if you, th if you think about it, somebody identity is also chronological. So you, you may have done something 10 years ago, and you're a very different person now, and maybe it's youthful mistakes, maybe you're doing your walk about your exploration, and you're different now, and should you be held to the crimes of your past, or if they were even crimes? So there was, I, I don't remember her name, but there was a school teacher earlier this year who was actually fired from her job in a California school because it turned out that several years ago she was, it was either a stripper or she worked in porn. And evidence of this came out, was presented to the principal of her school district, and she was then fired. So when you talk about separations of identity, and it, it, you have other things, like I showed you the, the Ellsberg mask in the beginning of this. You have one minute, okay. When I showed you guys the Ellsberg mask in the beginning of this, you have whistleblower protection, and you have the shield laws and things like that, too. So the notion of separation of context, the notion that people might, people besides little script kiddies that hang out on the internet may need this stuff is something that I'm just, I, I'm trying to get more people to think about. So with that, I think I'm actually going to conclude my talk. Thank you so much to, to Ben and Not Larry and Will Pig and Dagmar for making it possible for me to do this on basically virtually from Oakland, California. And please join Nimrites if you're interested. And, uh, I, I ramble on Twitter, on uh, A-E-S-T-E-T-I-X is my Twitter name, so if you are unfortunate enough to follow me, you will see more information about identity stuff there. So with that, I think I'm going to wrap this up, and thank you guys so much for allowing me to do this.